We have a, a great program for you. Unfortunately, the first uh, person listed here, uh, Professor Tassan, um, will be unable to make it. So I'll be uh, discussing some of our work um, in, a, in a different area. Uh, but our second uh, speaker this morning, uh, Ralph Jaramillo, will be talking about developing new semiconductors, uh, particularly uh, perovskite-based uh, um, uh, uh, sulfides and uh, selenides. And then we'll look at uh, microscopy in motion, using electron microscopy uh, to really understand how crystals grow uh, from um, Professor Francis Ross. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So I'm gonna talk about uh, guiding uh, thin film engineering uh, with state-of-the-art electron microscopy, uh, particularly a, a new technique, or well, a new old technique uh, called electron tychography that allows us to reach incredible resolutions and really access information about materials that we've only dreamt of in the past, uh, previously. So uh, the technique of choice in my group is scanning transmission electron microscopy, um, where we use a, a, a very finely focused electron probe that we raster across the sample and build up our images uh, point by point as we have down here. So we're building up this image. We can collect simultaneously spectroscopic information. And these are the images that you would typically see. This is an annular dark field image where you see the intensity of this image corresponds to how heavy the atoms are at those locations. So you can see the lead oxygen positions are the brightest. The magnesium, niobium, and titanium are the second brightest in that. And then oxygen is invisible in ADF. Uh, we can use techniques like differential phase contrast imaging to reveal the oxygen positions. And so these images are sensitive to the types and number of atoms present, but they're projections of the crystal structure. We're only getting two-dimensional information from these data sets. Um, and even so, STEM plays a really critical role in material science, understanding materials. Uh, it allows us to directly explore materials at the atomic scale with direct interpretability. Uh, those bright blobs, those are where atoms are at in the structure. Uh, that allows us to make uh, direct uh, insights into defects, second phases, uh, the interfaces, surfaces of materials, all with, from a single tool, uh, with simultaneous chemical information. What, how are the atoms bonded to each other? We can get that information out with electron microscopy. And even the stem image intensities can be quantitatively predicted and compared with our experiments to lead to even further insights into what we see uh, from these images. This is some work with uh, collaboration between my group and uh, Jaramillo's group, and uh, looking at these um, uh, calcogenide uh, interfaces with uh, oxides and understanding how those materials grow is directly revealed through these techniques. We can also do things like measure polarization on a unit cell by unit cell basis in these materials to give great insight into ferroelectricity, for example, or functional uh, behavior of materials um, as a function of composition. And the example that I'm going to talk about today is in antiferroelectric materials, where you have the polarization, unlike a ferroelectric, where the polarization is aligned uh, unit cell by unit cell along the same direction. With an antiferroelectric within the same unit cell, the dipoles um, are oppositely aligned such that uh, you have a net zero polarization in that structure. Uh, there are a couple of really interesting aspects of these materials. One is that as you apply a bias to the sample, you can force all of the uh, polarization to align in the same direction and go through a, a, uh, a phase transition to a ferroelectric, um, as you can see from this dialect, uh, the uh, PE loop splitting at these higher voltages. Uh, ultimately, the mechanisms uh, responsible, the types, uh, the impact of defects, the impact of interfaces can be difficult to directly um, understand from these property measurements alone. And that's where electron microscopy can play a, a significant role. Um, and this is just one example of one of these antiferroelectrics that we've been studying. Uh, it's uh, lead magnesium uh, uh, tongue state, not uh, niobate. Uh, thin film, so lead, to, uh, tung lead magnesium tungsten. Um, but what we found is that there are these boundaries in these materials, in these thin film materials. These boundaries, as we found from HADF, the standard uh, imaging technique, are antiphase boundaries. Uh, what that means is that the crystal uh, unit cell is misaligned by half a unit cell along um, on those planes, essentially. And 
Uh, these boundaries uh, appear chemically disordered. You can tell that by the sort of uh, intermediate contrast in those regions, and they have some pretty significant uh, differences uh, from the bulk, as you can see in this bottom image. But what are the consequences to the antiferroelectric behavior of these materials? What, what is the impact? Um, one of the problems to answer that question is with using HADF alone or ADF imaging alone, is that it's very difficult to distinguish um, whether or not uh, you have a random alloy at that boundary. This would be a simulation from a random alloy with the beam uh, scattered uh, along that projection. Um, it, an inclined boundary would essentially give the same sort of contrast as would a step boundary. So what, uh, what is the uh, true nature of this three-dimensional boundary that we have in our material? HADF can't do it. Um, that's where electron tychography can come to the rescue, particularly multi-slice electron tychography. Uh, what you have to remember is that in STEM imaging and, and all electron microscopy, diffraction and imaging data are only collected with intensity. The phase and amplitude of the wave function are lost. We need to return, we need ways to recover that phase and amplitude. And one way that you can do this is by scanning the electron beam across the sample with a defocused probe. So what we're doing here in this video is to walk along the sample with our electron beam. What we know about that is a phase shift that's being applied to the uh, probe. That's our known information. What's unknown is our object and even the incident electron wave function. And so because we have this highly redundant data where we have these overlapping disks of information in those patterns, those uh, shadow images, uh, that is enough information to iteratively solve for what that wave function must have been, as well as what the object must have been, and in three dimensions. Um, and we can do this uh, very fast. We're, we're pretty much doing this with every image that we acquire at this point um, with the microscope. Um, but these iterative methods can be used. Um, and more importantly, because we're removing that, uh, the initial wave function, even if there are lens aberrations, even if we have a fairly poor microscope in terms of the resolution of the microscope, we can remove that, those defects and get down to a resolution limited only by the thermal vibration of the atoms at that, um, in that case, which is about 0.2 angstrom. Um, and again, we can recover three-dimensional information as well. So let's just take a look. This would be a conventional ADF stem image. This is aluminum nitride. You can see this little tail sort of hazy off there if you squint. Um, this is a typical stem image. This is a typical tychographic reconstruction. Um, the structure becomes clear, exactly what you're looking at. This brighter is, uh, these brighter positions are aluminum. These darker ones are nitrogen. The resolution within this image is about 28 picometers, limited again by the thermal vibration of the atoms um, in that structure. Uh, so let's go back and uh, reapply this to those antiphase boundaries in uh, this uh, antiferroelectric. So there's our ADF image. Now with tychography, uh, you can very clearly resolve not just only the cations, the lead, magnesium, and tungsten, but instead you can also very clearly identify where all of the oxygen is at in that structure as well. Um, and you can do this with depth sensitivity. So if we look here, this is a reconstruction, and if you look carefully in this data set, you'll see intensity sort of walk along from the uh, left-hand side to the right-hand side uh, about, um, let me see, you can kind of see it sweep along there across as I sweep back and forth. Um, that's our antiphase boundary. Um, it's the extreme resolution, though, of these images that makes it very difficult to see this by eye. So we can extract this information out um, and plot it in a different way. This is just looking at the, those, uh, the, the magnesium and tungsten sites. And what you can see there is the chemical disorder um, at the phase boundary. In addition, we can also measure displacement. So here we're measuring uh, the lead-lead uh, distances from one another, and we can plot this out. And what we notice is that there is this um, uh, bright, dark, bright, dark, or, or small lead-lead displacements and uh, hot, uh, large uh, distances from one another as we go across, and they're correlated. They are um, patterned across there. That is a remnant anti-ferroelectric region within that material stabilized by that boundary. This information would have been completely lost previously. Out in bulk, this is uh, paraelectric. 
That's the, um, at, at, at room temperature and in bulk, uh, this sample will de uh, degrade back to uh, uh, a paraelectric, but it's that antiphase boundary that's actually stabilizing functional behavior that would otherwise be lost and that would otherwise be impossible to observe with the microscope. We can do this again in 3D, so we can build up these 3D volumes. This would be chemical order mapped across that 3D volume, and we can slice through and actually see that again, and we can correlate that antiferroelectric um, behavior at that boundary um, within that slice. The other uh, aspect of studying these materials is to also observe how they change dynamically. Um, and this would be applying a, a bias to samples in the electron microscope to particularly answer questions like what is the nature of those phase transition and what's the strain in the sample as we apply a bias at the nanoscale. Um, to do this, we can uh, build samples essentially or clip out samples from our, uh, uh, our thin film and build up a small tiny device there with a, with a focused ion beam and place it between two electrodes. We have our top contact connected through this electrode or bottom uh, contact or the substrate, our conductive substrate, niobium strontium titanate. And essentially what we're forming is a parallel plate capacitor that we can apply a bias across from uh, the platinum up there to the niobium STO down below and watch and quantify the behavior of these uh, materials um, as we go across. So uh, this is, would be using a uh, technique called um, Kepstrel analysis that allows us to map that strain from these diffraction patterns very precisely and accurately. And using virtual dark field, we can collect uh, specific diffraction information as we bias. And what we'll see there is that as we're biasing, first we have a significant phase transformation, that's what you're seeing in the video, is transforming from an antiferroelectric to that uh, ferroelectric uh, phase, as well as we can watch the diffraction patterns and map out strain and we see that basically out of plane expansion, this is almost 1% uh, out of plane expansion. That might not sound like a lot, but for anyone doing ferroelectrics or, or, or um, uh, relaxer ferroelectric work, those are high strains in a very thin film. This is about 100 nanometers thick. Um, and that aligns with ex, uh, ex situ measurements with uh, XRD or um, other methods. So that's just a brief overview of how we use uh, electron microscopes to get deep insights into the behavior of functional materials. Uh, here I focused on antiferroelectrics, but these can be applied uh, everything from metals to semiconductors to insulators. These techniques are universal and can provide uh, deep insights into materials properties. So with that, uh, I have to, of course, thank all of my uh, students and postdocs and uh, collaborators uh, for uh, collaborating on this work. Um, so what we're going to do now is switch over to uh, Raf, who's going to take up uh, the, the, the challenge of developing new semiconductors, and uh, we'll take questions at the end um, as, a, as a group. So with that, save your questions, and uh, Raf, please. Your computer. So I need to... Uh okay. It's working? It's working. You can hear me. And it doesn't go back, so I better not make any mistakes. All right, so my talk is called Why New Semiconductors? And so there's lots of semiconductors. This is a partial list, like off the top of my head last night. You can think of more. Um, but really, this is the reality for most of our technologies. And, you, and perhaps you know, most people here know, know that already. So let me motivate for you why we should continue to, to mess around in the lab and try to invent new semiconductors. Right, so let's start with um, thin film PV. Thin film PV is dirt cheap, it's a commodity. Why on earth would we be like innovating there? Um, well, so silicon photovoltaics has benefits of manufacturing scale. It has a mature roadmap. Um, they're high performance, they're reliable, they're bankable, they're earth abundant, non-toxic. What's not to like? Um, from the manufacturing perspective, there's a lot not to like, which is that it requires wafering and wafer handling um, because it's not an ideal material for PV. And so as a result, the manufacturing is really segmented. And you have all these different factories in different parts of the globe doing this, that, and the other thing. So thin film PV, thin film is streamlined for manufacturing because it's basically a series of lamination steps. And you can, because of that, you can use semiconductors, well, in order to enable that, you use semiconductors that are better for solar energy conversion. 
um, you get better materials utilization, and you can use the various form factors. However, the performance lags, continues to lag. There are re reliability concerns. And a lot of the technologies use expensive and uh, rare and or toxic elements. So there's a lot not to like. That said, from the manufacturing perspective, if you look at what First Solar has done, it looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss book, right? Um, it's right on the back end of a float glass factory. The, the glass comes in one end of the machine, and a solar cell comes out the other end, because it's a series of lamination steps. So that still remains the dream. Um, so we have not yet developed a thin film technology that's scalable, stable, made of nice things, and amenable to streamlined manufacturing and high performance. So um, I'm not going to delve into the details here. This is from a paper from now some years ago from Vladimir Antonio Bornacisi, sort of highlighting where we still don't have the technology to make thin film PV really take off. The story remains the same. Silicon dominates. Right? This is market uh, share. Um, uh, thin film is a little green sliver on top. It's a thin film <laughs> on top of the baseline, which is market dominance of silicon. And if you look at this in terms of just total amount of um, production, uh, you know, thin film is that little green slice on the left and it's not really growing. Um, so we still have, you know, an enormous opportunity to develop a thin film based PV technology that can compete with silicon. Just because it doesn't exist yet doesn't mean that it's forbidden by the laws of physics. So um, one of the things my group works on is called cogenide perovskites. So that's two words. I want to explain what they mean because they're less common. Um, Calcogenide comes from the Greek for copper loving. Now, if you run a vacuum chamber, that's like the worst thing, but anyway, we deal with it. Um, they're compounds made from sulfur and selenium and tellurium. And there's a lot of calcogenide compound semiconductors already in circulation. Perhaps you use them uh, without knowing it. And then perovskites are this typical um, crystal structure, which is discovered in oxides, you know, almost you know, a century and a half ago. And um, oxide-based perovskites are also um, in your pocket and in many technologies. Um, uh, but halide-based perovskites have gotten a lot more um, press lately because of their outstanding PV performance. Again, work from the Bulovich Group and, and others have really pioneered this. Um, so um, why keep going, right? Why new semiconductors? Why am I doing this? Well. Uh, Halide perovskites have advantages and disadvantages, and we're trying to address the disadvantages. Calcogenide perovskites, we're going to put these together, perovskites made out of calcogen, um, have these following advantages. They're stable in air and at high temperature, so you can infer, oh, the halides must not be. That's true. Um, they're composed of earth and non-toxic elements, right? Lead is a problem, I believe, for lead halide perovskites. Um, and they're a host of as of recently, only theoretically predicted semiconductors with direct band gap. So this plot, if you make optoelectronic devices, you know what this is. It's called a Cho plot, named after the inventor of MBE, Al Cho. And it simply puts all the materials on a plot of uh, band gap versus lattice constant. And from this, you can start designing devices. And um, several years ago, I put these red dots on there, totally irresponsible, because no one had ever made those before. Those were based on theoretical predictions um, for the calcogenite perovskites. People had made powders of those materials. But in order to make this real, you need film growth, and you need epi growth. So long story short, you know, these materials, calcogenite perovskites, have been made um, in powder form since at least the 1950s. You can see the beautiful hand-drawn axes. Um, in the 2010s, there's renewed interest in semiconductivity, some very microscopic but beautiful single crystals um, in recent years. And then the uh, thin films start appearing, but um, to be honest, they're not good. And now at MIT, we've achieved wafer scale epitaxial film. So you know, I don't have time for details here, but these are some images that we've taken of films recently where we have um, epitaxial films over large areas. They're very um, uh, smooth. And we have you know, sort of more scientific evidence for that. But somehow we've taken to taking pictures of r flowers reflected in the film um, to deal with the referee complaint originally. It just kind of looks nice. And then the picture on the right, um, the fact that those are different shades of brown is um, summarizes the fact that we can also change the band gap by changing the composition. Um, if you want to go from an orange material towards something useful for solar cells, you want to make it more brown, because you want it to be darker and absorb more of the light. So, um, so we've done that. We've made these films um, epitaxy with tunable band gap from 1.4 to 1.9 EV. The data here is really only for specialists, um, but it demonstrates atomic smoothness and epitaxial growth. 
Um, this data Jim already showed, so this is a sort of mic microscopy that, that I can't do, but other uh, others here can. I'm showing atomic scale interfaces. And, and this is our now addition to the Cho plot. We've done a little bit um, with you know, more sobriety. So this is actually based on data. So we're putting our own alloys on this Cho plot and showing how we're able to um, realize the theoretical predictions of the tunable band gap, getting into that range for optimal for single junction solar cells. Um, so uh, uh, where's the research outlook? Well, there's a lot to be done. Um, the theoretically predicted band gap range for this, these materials go from the green to like the kind of mid-wave IR. And only, only those materials with the black dots are those that have been made and measured in the lab. So you can see that um, there's a lot of theory predictions to test. Now, my chemical intuition would look at this and screen out a bunch of them, right? I'm not going to go try to make all of those. But there is sort of a nice playground or, you know, um, treasure map uh, for semiconductor. We need a lot of progress in materials processing. That's, you know, what I like to work on. We need to make these films faster and at lower temperature. And then we need a lot of progress in doping and defect engineering. Those are other things which I like to work on, so that's why I'm highlighting them, right? Understanding how defects interact uh, for better or for worse with the properties. Um, in terms of applications, coming back to PV, um, you know, these are promising for solar cells because they have the right band gap and they're stable and they're earth abundant and they're uh, so forth and so on. Um, they're, uh, you know, just highlighting one aspect here. The materials I showed you are made out of pretty inexpensive um, elements. So that's good. Um, you know, we, have, we don't have solar cells yet because the films, we need too high temperature to grow them. So we can't use traditional device architecture. So we're working to bring that down. Um, that said, we can measure solar cell relevant properties. And what we can do is highlight how those properties compare to other more established solar cell materials. So the abscissa here measures something called the minority carry lifetime, which is um, uh, an important metric for PV performance. It's a predictor of PV for performance. And our semiconductors have very promising minority carry lifetime. Now that's marked with the vertical dash lines, but we have nothing on the ordinate. <laughs> we don't have solar cells yet. But this is motivation co to continue that work. Okay, no. um, so with the remaining five minutes, I want to continue to motivate new materials, uh, new semiconductors. And this is now going to end on microelectronics, which is probably a little bit closer to most of our hearts in the room. Right. So the race to replace silicon is kind of turned out to be more like an ultramarathon. Um, there's lots of ways to um, illustrate this. Uh, I like this quote. Many of us have seen this quote. Thus, for many years, gallium arsenide was labeled as a semiconductor of the future, and it will always be that way. Recently, however, advances in compact disk technology <laughs> and mobile telephony. So already, you know, you can see, like, the decades move on, and, and we're still looking at, oh, what's next after silicon, right? Um, and so this is global market in 2022 uh, for wafers. And so we know this. Um, silicon dominates. Uh, for good reasons. However, uh, there are really compelling needs for new channels in ultra high performance, low power transistor technology. Right? Moore's law is continuing. Um, however, chip performance does not, right, on a, on a per chip basis. So one of the reasons for that is that on chip power densities is, is expanding. Um, you know, you could have pictures of eggs frying on computers, talk about Denard scaling. Um, performance is maintained through you know, multi-core approaches, heterogeneous integration, lots of really innovative things. Um, however, it remains a fact that we're kind of in trouble in terms of the power required for computing in the future. So how do we get around that? Um, people much more knowledgeable than I have focused on these 2D materials as one possible solution for ultra-low power transistors. Um, there was a time several years ago when I assumed that all of this was just for us academics. It was not real. It was not important for computing. I have been convinced otherwise because mainly through some really wonderful studies out of IMEC in Belgium. But um, basically, you know, don't trust me. If you look at any of the major manufacturers um, uh, of, um, of the leading edge transistor technology, uh, TMD-based logic devices are on their roadmaps. So, you know, it seems worth working on. Um, the, the challenge which we're focusing on here in my group is this very, very narrow aspect of this. It's a collaboration with Frances Ross, so it's nice that she takes over after me, which is that we're going to need dielectrics. Um, 
Dielectrics are, you know, an essential part of a field effect transistor. And uh, integrating dielectrics with these 2D materials is an entirely new challenge. This is a lovely um, review paper from the Grasso group at TU Vienna. Um, if you're going to read one review of the state of this field, I would read that review. And the fact that these various approaches illustrated here are obviously cartoons, they're on purpose cartoons, gives you a sense of the challenge, right? If you're going to take these dielectrics, you just kind of magically put them on the 2D semiconductor and voila, right? That's kind of where we are. We need, we need real innovation on processing in order to get to the point where we can do this reliably at manufacturing scale. So Francis and I have been looking at oxidation as a possible solution to this challenge. Oxidation is scalable. It's established. Um, let's talk about how established it is. If you look at the history of MOSFET technology, the earliest um, patents were at Lilienfeld in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, it was almost 30 years before this stuff made it to manufacturing. Um, why? Well, there's probably many answers to that, and some are more accurate than the answer I'm going to give, I'm sure. But the answer I'd like is that one of the most outstanding challenges was that of controlling the interface states at the, at the semiconductor dielectric interface. In other words, better control and understanding over the oxidation process in silicon. So we're sort of trying to reinvent history here and start over again at the atomic scale, trying to understand the oxidation of these new 2D materials. And it turns out it's really different than oxidation of silicon. And that's fun for us because we do you know, basic materials research and we like things that are new and different. So um, to give a snapshot here, we see the left-hand picture is an SEM micrograph of what happens when you oxidize molydisulfide. Right? If you take a silicon wafer, you put it in an oxidation furnace, and you take a micrograph afterwards, it looks almost unchanged because the oxidation proceeds um, leaving all of the silicon atoms more or less in place, just the growth of an oxide as oxygen diffuses in and disrupts the crystal structure. Here we don't get that at all. We get these, in a sense, beautiful crystallites of oxide growing on the semiconductor. Um, beautiful things to look at in the microscope, but totally useless if you're doing planar device processing. So, you know, we, we can sort of make predictions and, and test out different ways of processing the materials. This is, you know, a small step forward recently, which is we show with using non-thermal plasma-based techniques, we can, we can oxidize these materials um, in a way that leaves the layer, you know, conformal and so forth. So it gets into details. I love this. I'm going to preview Francis's talk, basically, Steel Her Thunder, which is, uh, this is actually a TEM movie of molly disulfide oxidizing. Um, the sort of data that her group can um, acquire. So, you know, some research directions here. I personally am very interested in one class of uh, TMDs for, for which their native oxides are already proven high-performance dielectrics. So that's sort of basic research. It's something I'm interested in. Um, we're studying this by TEM, by ETEM, that's Francis's work, other techniques more based in my group. Um, and we, we have some work cut out for us in terms of measuring properties. But, you know, the big challenge is that, you know, the left-hand side is like some pictures on my table in my office of some samples we're studying, right, of, of some lesser studied semiconductors. And we oxidize them, we measure the properties. And, you know, we want to get from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We're able to feed into these roadmaps that are looking out into the 2030s. And so there's a lot of work to be, to be done. Okay. Um, I want to thank my group. Uh, <laughs> I like this picture from, from, the, from this winter, actually. Um, and uh, let's see, other pictures just for fun. And uh, thank you. Okay, quick change of technology here. Let's see. How's that? Excellent. All right. Well, I really love it that this session is called the next materials revolution, because Raf has described very well how advances in all kinds of different areas, uh, from photovoltaics to new kinds of transistors that maybe use less power, uh, is all driven by the ability to build new materials with particular properties. 
And then Jim showed some of the amazing tools that you can use in the electron microscope to see what those materials are. So I'm going to bring those two things together by talking about some of the new capabilities in MIT.nano and some of the things that we think will be possible and have uh, and, and based on work that uh, we and many other people have done in the past. So, um, as I said, it's a real grand challenge in material science. In order to get the, the next generation of materials, we want to be able to design and build materials that have specific and useful properties. So, as you saw just now, electronic or uh, optical properties, mechanical, magnetic, etc. And we often find that if you go to the nanoscale, uh, you, you get new tools for achieving this goal because shrinking the size of a material often unlocks new properties. Materials behave differently in nanoscale sizes than they would in bulk. So, how do you make the most general nanoscale material? Supposing you even knew what you wanted to build. I want these particular atoms to go in this particular um, configuration. Uh, obviously, you can put them one by one into their spots. And that's what's shown here in this, uh, in this first image from uh, IBM a few years ago. That's not going to work. Uh, you can see um, there are, what, 12 iron atoms and they've been arranged one at a time. Clearly not useful for real life, although it's a fabulous way to publish your work in high impact journals when you have these images that show individual atoms and you can measure the properties of the assembly of those atoms. So what we want to do instead is use self-assembly to make nanoscale new materials. Self-assembly is a spontaneous process. That's in its name, right? Things self-assemble. They do it without us individually telling each atom where to go. Um, and uh, one example is from MIT Nano. If you look, at, uh, if you, if you look on, on the beautiful new glass when the building was first built, the raindrops would fall into perfectly circular droplets because the surface was, was so pristine. Now, we don't tell each droplet to be a semi a hemisphere, but obviously it's doing that to minimize its surface energy. Surface tension pulls the water molecules into a particular configuration without the human having to do anything of, on those individ individual droplets. So simple self-assembly, it can be cheap, it can be parallel, it's a good way of manufacturing new kinds of materials. But can we use these techniques to build complex structures? Well, our thesis is that if you want to understand how complex structures build, uh, are built using processes that are spontaneous or that we would like to uh, drive within by setting the the environmental parameters, then you want to actually observe those processes at work. And that's where electron microscopy comes into it. So here's an example. Well, here's a set of examples. I want to show you some movies of different electron microscopy experiments to illustrate the kind of thing you can do in, uh, in the equipment of the day. So this first one is a catalyst at work, right? That thing on the top um, is a droplet of a gold liquid uh, alloy, a eutectic alloy. Alloy, and we, we, the, the sample is at about um, 400 degrees C, and it sits on top of this dotted region is silicon atoms. So we have a silicon post with a catalyst on top. And I'll describe um, exactly what that's good for in a few moments. But for now, I want you to look at the fabulous contrast on this thing, right? There's a liquid in the middle. There's this kind of skin on the outside. And you can see that the surface atoms are ordered into layers. Um, these determine the proper of the catalyst. The nanoscale features of catalytic particles are what determines how uh, powerful, how efficient, how useful those catalytic materials are. And uh, you cannot see this if you just have the material out on the bench. Whatever you do, if it's not actually working, doing its job, it doesn't have the correct configuration. So things change as you change the temperature, as you flow the gas, as you do the catalytic reaction, the particles are very dynamic. You need to see them in the microscope. All right, so, so look at the length scale there, 1.5 nanometers. We're looking at the atomic level details. Let's go 
outer step. And let's look at the uh, properties of assemblies of atoms. So those triangles in the middle movie are gold triangles grown on uh, a 2D material, um, on graphene. Um, what I'm going to show you now is a little bit of motion of these islands as we heat up the sample. Um, what you can see is they're actually turning around and they jump around from place to place. It's not just us jiggling the microscope. They're actually moving. And look at the bottom one. It's going to make a, a rotation in a moment. Here we go. Yep. Do you see that? Isn't that fun? So, so the, this is telling us that the gold island is not chemically bonded strongly onto the graphene surface. The chemical configuration of the gold and the graphene are kind of incompatible, so that material bond is very weak. That's what causes the difficulty in growing good dielectrics on 2D material surfaces. So in, in situ microscopy can help us understand what's going on. Now the final one, let's, let's go out even one more, one more step, and let's look at liquid dynamics. So this uh, last movie shows the nucleation growth, coalescence, and motion of bubbles that are being generated in, uh, in water. They're coming off some little defect that's within the, uh, the, the, the sample. And look at the length scale. These are nanoscale bubbles. Um, you can see the nucleation events are visible when the thing is a few tens of nanometers in diameter. So nanoscale bubbles behave quite differently from larger scale bubbles, and yet they're extremely important in corrosion, in catalysis, uh, in cavitation, and in, I'm sure, many other things that don't begin with a C. So, uh, so nanobubble dynamics, you can see it in the microscope if you trap the liquid between two windows windows and record a movie of it. So how do we do these kinds of experiments? So this is, an ex this is a, a microscope that's uh, in MIT. This one was built in IBM. I moved from IBM to MIT, and I was fortunate to bring the equipment with me. Uh, for some reason, nobody else wanted it. But look, look at this fabulous thing, right? So the microscope is where it says imaging. You can see the microscope itself, that columnar part. The electrons are generated at the top. They go through some lenses. The sample is kind of in the middle. And then down at the bottom, you see the viewing screen, and the camera is even below that. So that's how we record the images. But we want to heat the sample. We want to flow some gases. Do you see it says gas flow? There's a, there's a box with gas uh, bottles in it. Um, and then we want to be able to do all kinds of things to the sample to prepare it before we do the um, actual experiment. And if you look on the side, we can do spectroscopy, evaporation. We can put the sample in. And the key thing is that all of this is at ultra high vacuum. The sample, when it's loaded in, it goes into this extremely well controlled uh, environment where somewhat like in interstellar space, there just aren't that many molecules or atoms around to contaminate the surface. So you put the sample in, you clean it up, and then you have a perfectly defined starting surface to do the experiments. Um, and the, ty the types of experiments are what I'm going to show now. So I want to show a couple of examples of the types of, of nanoscale materials development that you can do in the electron microscope. So this first movie, um, go for it, is the growth of a silicon nanowire. So it's the same process I showed earlier, but at somewhat lower magnification. You can see the catalyst is this black cylinder is this black hemisphere on top. Um, the, the wire that's growing is the, is the post. And we didn't just move the sample to record this movie. You can tell that because if you look at the features on the side of the post, you can see they're perfectly still. So it's really growing as we watch. And the PowerPoint view of this growth process is shown there. You supply silicon as a gas to a catalytic particle. It sticks. It gets adsorbed onto the, onto the catalyst, transmitted through to the growth front. The atoms add one at a time uh, onto the growth front, resulting in the formation of the post of silicon. And this is a way of creating nanoscale structures. Um, growing a single like wire of silicon isn't that exciting because there are other ways of doing it. Uh, for example, subtracting, starting with a lot of silicon and subtracting uh, the stuff you don't want. Uh, however, you can imagine that if you turn off one gas, you turn on another one, you're going to grow a little section that has a different composition. And so in this way, we can create the kinds of structures that might form uh, electronic devices as a post. They could have a wraparound material added to them. You can get uh, three-dimensional transistor structures using this type of catalytic growth. 
So the second example I'll show uh, relates to two-dimensional crystals, which we've heard a lot of um, during, over the day. Uh, imagine a sheet of, in this case, molybdenum disulfide, and we've deposited gold on top of it. Gold is just a test thing to make sure we understand what's going on. You can see this fabulous contrast. These images are, um, are very artistic in my view. You can see just about the atomic uh, level details within the 2D material, and then you see this, these big black and white spots are the moiré pattern that results when you have the gold atoms on top and the atoms of the molybdenum disulfide beneath. They have a different atomic spacing, and so the patterns kind of beat together. They, they, they're in phase and then out of phase, then in phase, um, and that results in the strong contrast in the microscope. And again, at higher resolution, you can see them moving around at room temperature. Do you see the little jiggles in that last movie? The atoms, uh, the gold is not well stuck down onto the 2D surface. Um, it's important for us to understand how to assemble materials on 2D surfaces, because ev if you think about it, every two-dimensional material exists in the 3D world. It's surrounded on both sides by other materials, and we need to be able to control those junctions to get, for example, current in and out, to apply a voltage, to get catalytic reactions to take place, to get superconductivity. So using electron microscopy to visualize these interfaces and the formation of materials on different types of 2D surface really is a, a key thing to enabling the use of these materials in uh, real life applications. All right, so I've shown you what the kinds of things are that we can do. Um, the equipment can be complicated. Uh, it's quite achievable, but you can, you can develop it even further to combine the kinds of wonderful high-performance microscopy with the in-situ capabilities, the cleaning, the gas flow, the et cetera, stuff that we need to do to enable the experiments. And so we're in the process of building a new generation of materials, of microscopes to do these experiments. This is going to be unique in the world. The column is designed to get the best possible vacuum around the sample while still allowing us to flow gases or pass a current or even cool the sample. Um, the, the sample sits on this cartridge that I've shown in the middle. And then we have to attach to all those other chambers to do all the prep work. And you can see there's some development that still needs to take place. At least we have something to show people. But this is all under development. And sometime next year, we'll hope to get some, at least some kind of images out of the microscope. All right. So um, this will lead to a kind of a dream of uh, of electron microscopy of materials that sort of unifies the things that we've seen today. This is an example of a potential uh, qubit material, a quantum material. It's a magnetic 2D um, semiconductor. And you can see what, uh, what, what you could imagine doing is having a perfectly clean sample, well controlled. You can use the electron beam to change the positions of the atoms. You can use computational techniques to help you understand what's going on and to, and to, dis to, to tell you what experiment to perform next. And then you can hope to get uh, experiments where you can create individual qubits. These, these pictures at the bottom show small magnetic structures, um, atomic level magnetic structures within this material that, <coughs> that can be created using the electron beam. So there's a lot of um, opportunities in this field. We need to develop new ways of building the next generation of materials. Um, we need to use electron microscopy to help us understand not only what the structure is after it's built, but how it came to be so that we can use that information to direct our attention towards the, the most optimal kinds of synthesis strategies. If we put all of this together, um, recording changes in crystals when they're exposed to different environments really helps us to understand nanoscale reactions and design new materials using the important strategies that will make for real real uh, real life applications and there are certainly challenges in these in these experiments especially the cost complexity uh, quantification but i think the next few years in this nano in this piece of the nano realm are going to be really amazing so thanks for your attention so
Okay. We're going to open it up to the questions. Okay, if there are questions. <laughs> ah, okay, so uh, we have a question from on, online. What is, the what is the 3D resolving power of tachygraphy? Um, can you basically re reconstruct an at, uh, material atom by atom? Unfortunately, not yet. Um, the, re the, the, the depth resolution is somewhere around uh, two to three nanometers or, or less. So we're not quite at the single atomic uh, plane level, uh, but we're getting there. Um, in the next, uh, you know, uh, next few years, I would say, we would be able to achieve that. Um, the next question is, assuming I have a good TEM sample, what are the practical limitations of characterizing materials with tachygraphy? Um, there are a broad range of challenges. Um, the biggest challenge, honestly, is computational power. Um, we have access to the uh, so-called uh, super cloud uh, that's linked to um, uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. Um, but that gives us access to, access to a lot of GPUs. Uh, GPUs are essential for uh, fast enough tachygraphy. A few isn't going to do it. You need uh, you know, access to uh, you know, tens of, of GPUs to do this in a reasonable amount of time. But otherwise, sample-wise, it, it, um, it just getting your parameters right, and uh, it, it kind of works by magic in a sense. Uh, it's computational imaging. One for you. Um, well, so for the calcogenide perovskites, we're developing it for solar cells. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there are folks in the world, um, uh, different, different countries that are developing these same materials for, for green LEDs, which is not an application need that I understand very well. Um, so I, I don't want to say that they're going to be useful there. Um, we're designing it for solar cells because perhaps it will be the Goldilocks material that will unlock the market potential of thin film PV. Um, with respect to uh, the 2D materials, uh, you know, um, Francis and I and many thousands of others are very much working along that path to uh, lower the power requirement of future computers. And um, there's many other applications of 2D materials, too many to list here, proposed. Still the most useful is lubricant, right? Um, dry lubricant, so you can go to your hardware store. Electronics, you do. Right. Um, how do we keep the electronic properties? Well, so that's an excellent question. One of the, let me expand that a little bit. Um, one of the reasons why 2D materials are, are very promising for transistors is that as you um, scale down the channel, um, that is the little part of the electron valve you want to turn on and off on a transistor, um, electron and hole scattering from the surfaces becomes more and more detrimental. So this is where um, something like molydisulfide starts to shine over silicon, even though nominally you may know that molydisulfide has a much lower electron mobility and hole mobility than silicon, like 10 times lower. But when you get really, really small and surfaces start to dominate the transport, a material with inert interfaces starts looking really good. And it turns out, you know, numerically, it, it's, it should perform very well. So why are we going to go mess up those interfaces again, right, with something like oxidation? I would say that's something we have to control really well, just as it was for silicon-based field effect transistor technology. We're not there yet. <laughs> How do we know self-assembly would give the desired structure? So this is, this is the kind of the, the central question in self-assembly. So I have an, an, allergy, an analogy that I used when I was talking to our students at one point. So, so we have cats at home, right? Many of you must have pet cats, right? Uh, how do you, uh, so you know that cats will do whatever they want to do, but if you have a tin with food in it, you also know that you can get the cats to come exactly here at this exact time to eat the food. So with self-assembly, you need to work out what is the equivalent trigger for the atoms. And that means you need to know what are the controlling forces that tell the atoms which is, I mean, they're going for the lowest energy configuration. So what determines the lowest energy configuration? So for water droplet, it's surface tension that makes a hemispherical or a, a spherical cap 
on the surface, but it's also the balance between the surface energy, the interface energy, and the energy of the rest of the glass surface that determines the angle it comes down around the perimeter. So we have a balance of several different forces that will uh, control the droplet shape. And if we change, for example, the temperature or the gas environment, we can change those energies and thereby change the shape that, we, that results. So for self-assembly, the question is, what are the equivalent things for each process that you'd like to control. And that's really where the, the essence of our research and many others comes in. Can we work out what's going on? What pathway do the atoms take to get where they, where they end up? And what are the ways to influence those paths? Is it temperature? Is it flow rate? Is it some gas environment? Is it something more subtle? Like if we grow in an electric field, that creates a bias that will make structures lose some symmetry and uh, grow in certain directions and not others. So there's a lot of different knobs you can change. It would be um, an amazing thing in the future if we had enough of a database that we could ask that kind of question for a new material system and have some reasonable suggestions from, the, uh, from some software. I don't think it would put us out of a job. Uh, because there's still the actual practicalities to be done. But we have a lot of choices that we can uh, make when we do the experiments. And we need some intuition, some experience to uh, decide what, what, which choice, which of the many things we should do. Right. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, all. And uh, yeah. well, next session. Right. Good.